Pan, welcome to the Ravit Show. I'm with Anna and Will from Kestra. Kestra is launching 1.0 and uh, an enterprise orchestration platform built to unify data, AI, infrastructure, and business workflows. So I'm super excited to chat with them. We've all seen the growth of Kestra and uh, the great things they've been doing in the open source community as well. Uh, let's get straight to what this is. Uh, this means for teams and um, what's the good news. Uh, first of all, Anna, Will, uh, your debut on the Robert Show. Super excited to chat with you both. And congrats on Kestra 1.0 launch. Um, uh, just for audience, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Tell us what do you do at Kestra? Yeah, so um, I'm a developer advocate at Kestra. Basically, my role is around helping people understand how they can build with orchestration. Because a lot of people don't necessarily know what that means. And especially as we enter this world of agentic orchestration, which is obviously a relatively new term being thrown around, is how do people utilize that? Because while we're introducing things like AI agents, which are very powerful, it's not always mm. necessarily the right thing to build with. Yep. Okay, uh, that's uh, pretty interesting. I'm gonna, uh, you know, get into uh, the the features, and I want a little bit of introduction of the 1.0. Uh, so, uh, can you give me, uh, a, uh, give my audience a little bit more about what new features does Kestra 1.0 introduce, Anna? Yeah, so we, we've shipped so many features, right, in this release. So I've already mentioned AI Copilot that helps you yep. uh, generate workflow code. Um, so instead of writing it yourself, um, on top of that, uh, we have AI agents that uh, can connect your workflows to uh, LEMS, uh, memory, and tools. Uh, so you can automate pretty much any process. You can connect your uh, workflows to uh, various MCP servers, right? To uh, integrate them with any uh, custom service. And on top of that, what is really unique about the agents in, in Kestro under zero is that instead of actually having to build, let's say, custom MCP servers, custom integrations for uh, to connect to your AI agents, you can leverage our pre-built uh, plugins. We have uh, over 900 nice. plugins in Kestra that you can leverage out of the box as tools to your AI agent. Uh, yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, Will, uh, what are your favorite features among them and why? Uh, and anything that you would like to add to uh, the introduction as well around uh, the Kestra 1.0? Yeah, so there's a big push for AI features, but actually one of my sort of hidden secrets is the new playground feature, which allows you to sort of iteratively build your workflows where rather than having to build your workflow and run the whole thing, which sometimes could take ages to run. Yep. Now you can just run one task at a time. So let's say you've got to download a big bunch of data so that you can then transform it. Now it will cache that and you can just focus on building the t uh, building on top of the task that's going to transform it. And that's going to make building workflows for me so much easier and yep. save me a lot of time. And yeah. along with along with uh, with the playground, we uh, we have um, um, uh, moved many features that already existed in Kestra before uh, into general availability. Uh, so features such okay. as unit tests for flows, uh, plugin versioning, uh, flow level SLAs, uh, and including the playground feature uh, are now out of beta, so you can use them in production. Um, and speaking of production, uh, we made it so much so much easier to move your workflows uh, from development to production uh, through two new uh, new features. Uh, one of them is Git Sync. Uh, so there is a new tenant sync uh, capability that you can simply uh, connect your um, uh, development instance to, to specific Git uh, repository and branch. And you can then, via yeah, pull requests, move to production and kind of uh, sync it in reverse from Git to Kestra to the production server, right? So the new right. Git makes it that much easier, right? To move from development to production, from idea to uh, to real uh, business impact. And there are also new Helm charts uh, in, in this release uh, to also with one Helm chart for a development proof of concept and another Helm chart for production to make it really just uh, super seamless and, and easy. Yeah, uh, thanks for adding that and uh, great insights. Uh, I'm kind of also curious to know a little bit about, you know, uh, declarative agentic orchestration, uh, if there's any, uh, you th with any one concrete example uh, from intent to execution that you can share would be amazing. Anyone, maybe Anna will, whoever wants to take this. Yeah, on. I could uh, 
we talk about this. So uh, where this comes in handy is where historically, if we look at orchestration in the past, right, you'd have to predefine every step of the process, right? which means if you end up having inputs that aren't necessarily guaranteed to be in a format that you expect, Mm -hmm. These workflows fall flat. They don't know how to work. Whereas uh, in ag agentic orchestration, you let the LLM figure out how it's going to best handle that. So for example, we did uh, an example where you might want to do market research. You give your agent access to web search. You give it access to a large language model, and it will go away and figure out what search terms it's going to use and how it's going to best figure that out based on the prompt you give it rather than you having to have a step that says put these specific search terms into google or whatever to get the answer because they may not be the correct terms the next day or in a month's time so it allows your workflow to effectively adapt without you having to consistently adapt it over time and sure. what's what's, what's um, worth contrasting in this example, right? With the with the market research, like in the traditional workflow, you would first define a task that uh, would need to extract data from specific sources that you want to extract data from, right? Then you would have some task that would say for each of those sources now extract key insights and uh, summarize them into this format. So you would have this kind of map reduce style workflow, right? Where you go from the yep. single single task that fans out into multiple and you need to kind of reduce to aggregate it uh, to get the single uh, report right in the end. And with yep. AI, since you don't have to kind of code this whole map reduce and all those all those steps, it can figure out how to do that. You simply uh, define or, or declare the desired outcome and it will figure out how to do that. So in the end, you know, with, with AI agents, this is like the most declarative as it can be, right? Yeah. There's yep. no need encode everything in YAML, you simply give it a natural language prompt and it will figure out what to do. Love it. Uh, I have a very different question and it's always where people, you know, ask that, oh, AI agents have these capabilities, they can do this. But I have a question for you all. What are the downsides of AI agents and when to use them, when not? Uh, what's the thought process there? Yeah. So if you've got a workflow like an ETL pipeline where you're getting data in a rough format that you expect every time and you know how that's going to get processed, you don't really gain anything by having an LLM help out there mm. if you expect it to do the same thing every day, right? Like processing orders or something where the, the structure of that's not going to change. Uh, and that will also save you money because every yep. time you're using an agent, you're having to use tokens with some sort of large language model. And depending on the amount of data you're using, that could get quite expensive quite quickly. So uh, AI agents are, are definitely a good thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're the best tool every time. Yeah, and they are also non-deterministic, right? So you 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 cannot guarantee that you will get repeatable results, right? Mm, yep. And especially when you are orchestrating business critical workflows, uh, you need to. There is no room for error. You you need to make sure that if you do something like let's say um, coordinating uh, shipments, payments, placing trades, um, the errors there can be very costly, right? So you yeah. don't want to do <laughs> you don't want it just to like make up some random thing one day and you have. No right. idea why. Yeah, so you know, in, in the end with Kestra, we um the best part of our platform is we we give you the opportunity to have both, right? So on the one hand, you have you can have some workflows that use those new agentic capabilities, but for more predictable uh, workflows that uh, should that must be reliable, where there is no room for error, you can still rely on the traditional orchestration where you define all the steps ahead of time, uh, you test everything correctly, yep. and yep. you can be sure that everything. Uh, we work as expected in production every time. Love it. Great, ex uh, great explanation there. And um, I would have never expected, you know, because most of the times it's like, oh, you should be a a using AI agents. You should be using it for this. But uh, they there could be times where you don't need it. So you need to be careful about that as well. But uh, uh, moving on, just a quick question, because when we talk about AI agents or if, when we talk about AI in general as well, uh there's a lot of things around trust and you know control how do you keep control and trust intact uh, also cover approvals audit trails and roles uh, any thoughts around that uh, will anna yeah um so 
the best bit about the AI agents is you have full observability and control still. So you can have workflows where you can have a human in the loop part. So mm. when you have the AI agent decide something, you can have someone go in and verify that the result you expect, you know, it's the result you expected and something that isn't completely random. So before it then gets pushed into something, you know, public or into a production environment so you've got that control that you can still have if you want it or you might want to actually just focus on speed and having it shipped regardless yep. um but then also there's all the full full capability of logging so you can see exactly what it's doing when um so it's easy to kind of look back at the sort of trail to find out if something did go wrong you can sort of figure out why it went wrong yep yep and, yeah, then we automatically, you know, uh, track things like token usage, exact duration of each request and response. Nice. Um, so, you, and and all the metrics that we collect by default in Kestra, those are Prometheus metrics. So you can connect it to whatever observability tool you are already using, right? And you can track it directly there. Nice. And, um, yeah. So combine it with our audit logs and and our bag, you really get like this uh, this platform with full observability and enterprise grade uh, scalability, right? Uh, where you don't have to fear uh, unexpected costs with all the token usage or uh, some uh, some requests that you cannot uh, track. I see data engineers and engineers already getting the hearts in their eyes listening to all of this. So it is fantastic. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, quick one. How does the LTS release? Uh, what, what does it actually mean for Kestra? Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, so while Kestra has already been used by plenty of companies in production with, you know, hundreds of workflows, uh, this is of our stamp to say that Kestra is stable, it is mature, and it is ready okay. for your production environments. And to sort of back that up, uh, our long term support means that we'll now have two LTS versions a year, which will support for up to a year. So you can guarantee that if you're going to use a version of Kestra, it is going to get bug fixes. It is going to get supported. So you can trust that it's going to work for you in those sort of mission critical examples. Very important. Anna, anything to add? Yeah, to, to, to make it really easy, we, we added um, this latest LTS tag. So you don't have to, you know, uh, kind of like pin any exact version. If you pin your Kestra image to latest LTS, you will get this LTS version where you get one year of guaranteed maintenance and um, um, nice. all the backported fixes right away. Um, so yeah, and, and this is really important for especially for enterprise customers, right? Where uh, they are often, they, they cannot upgrade that quickly, right? All disruptive changes can be uh, can be costly for them. So uh, yeah, that's how we, that's our commitment to stability uh, of the platform. Love it. Uh, quick question for any one of you. If a team is on Airflow or a custom scheduler, what is the cleanest migration path? The, the cleanest, so um, essentially, I would always uh, caution every, anybody from Big Bang migrations, right? So the, with, as with any migration, you need to start small, uh, just take one workflow at a time. Uh, nice. We also have uh, Airflow plugin uh, for those who are already on Airflow. So you can simply uh, trigger an Airflow DAG from Kestra. So you don't have to, you know, migrate everything at once. You can start simply by triggering some Airflow DAGs from Kestra. And uh, when it comes to translating some logic from Airflow uh, to Kestra uh, YAML, uh, we hope that long term, maybe our AI copilot can help, you know. Uh, it can already generate um, nice. Kestra workflow code. It would be just a matter of the, like feeding the right examples of this is how it's done in Airflow, this is how it's done in Kestra, and it can kind of map and translate it uh, pretty nicely. Oh yeah. my God, I'm loving this. Uh, well, go on. Yeah, one extra thing to add as well. Kestra being language agnostic means regardless of what orchestration tool you have been using, if you've yep. got code in a script that is being run, it's very easy to just throw that into Kestra, tell it to run that on a schedule or however you want. And then you can, like Anna said, build from there. You can make integrate a little further with Kestra's rich ecosystem of plugins. You can also then slowly move workflows one at a time. So you don't have to go, like you say, all at once and hope that it works. You can sort of... <laughs> get more familiar with how it's working for your stuff and learn if you need to tweak anything. But the language agnostic bit really does mean that if you've got code that's being told to run somewhere else, it is super nice. simple just to pick it up, put it into Kestra and it will start running it. 
Uh, fantastic features, I guess, uh, and great explanation there. Uh, Anna, Will, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on Kestra 1.0. You all have been uh, killing it.